happens to be a festival day, so we'll be celebrating the name of Jesus. And uh, what a great name that is. So, a couple things about getting older, or, you know, moving into a new year. You know you're getting older when you say something to your grandkids that your parents always said to you, and you always hated it. <laughs> you know you're getting older when you sing along with the elevator music. You know you're getting older when you answer a question with, because I said so. <laughs> and you know you're getting older when you have a party and the neighbors don't even realize it. <laughs> Maybe some of you had one of those last evening. You know you're getting older when you do the hokey pokey and you put your left hip out and it stays out. <laughs> in the kindergarten Sunday school class at Life Community Church, in Sunnydale, Texas, the teacher told the children that Jesus was just like any other baby. Mary fed him and rocked him and sang to him and bathed him and even changed his diaper. Every little mouth dropped open when the teacher said, and changed his diaper. And they were all completely speechless. That was until finally Bethany told the teacher, Don't you think that's kind of personal? <laughs> Uh, and, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a little bit of wind out there today. Three-year-old boy watching the weather go from rainy to sunny to rainy to windy. Uh, said to his grandma, Grandma, does God have a remote control? <laughs> and it feels that way these days. Let's take a moment to turn to our left and right and tell our neighbor how glad we are that you're here on this uh, New Year's Day. <laughs>
good stewards of time.
11. This early Christian hymn points to Christ's self-emptying obedience on the cross as cause for his ex exaltation by God and worthy of praise by the entire cosmos. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
But the old power was bugging him back, and he needed to do something very quickly. So he used his father's prayer. Lord, we thank you for that, which we are about to do. <laughs> Welcome to worship at this first day of 2023. And though we don't know what challenges, headaches, and roller coaster rides will come our way in the new year, we do know that we don't have to face those challenges and roller coaster rides all by ourselves. Our Savior and friend Jesus has literally walked in our shoes and knows exactly what we need most as we seek to live our lives both boldly and faithfully. The theme for my message today is starting a new year with Jesus, and that pretty much sums up where our first priority needs to be. For following Jesus is the key to finding the fulfillment and freedom that we are looking for as we journey together into this brand new year. To get a better handle on the significance Jesus has for all of human history, as well as for us as a community of his followers, I want us to look together at the significance and origin of his name. Jesus is the Greek form of the Jewish name Joshua. Joshua means God saves. Mark Prado reminds us that the Jews chose names not only because of the meaning of the name itself, but because of the tradition associated with that particular name. So when someone is named Yeshua or Joshua, you want to look back to the first Joshua to find the meaning of the name. The name Joshua takes us back to what experience? You guys remember? The Exodus. <coughs> the liberation of the Jews from slavery in Egypt and the establishment and the fulfillment of their life in the promised land. The two most important people of that period are Moses and Joshua. Moses began the Exodus, and Joshua finished it. Therefore, if you want to understand who Jesus was and what he means to us, then you need to look at his name and the tradition associated with it. The Gospel writers told the story of Jesus a parallel to the story of Moses. Hebrew legend says that Moses' father received a visitation from an angel who revealed that Moses' son would be the one who would liberate the Jews from Egypt. Matthew reports that Joseph had a similar dream of who Jesus is to be. And his name comes to Joseph, and that, of course, is what brings us to today's gospel. The revelation is that the name of this new child will be Jesus, which means God shall save his people from their sins. Look at the other parallel. Pharaoh threatens to slaughter the Hebrew children, and Moses is spared when his mom puts him in a basket and sends him down the Nile. Herod slaughters the innocent children of Bethlehem, and Jesus is spared when Joseph is told to go to Egypt. Moses crossed the Red Sea into 40 years of wilderness wandering. Jesus crosses the River Jordan after his baptism and enters into 40 days and nights of temptation. These parallels were not lost on the people in those days who first heard the good news of Christ proclaimed. They understood by those parallels who Jesus was and what he came for. Moses received the Ten Commandments, the law of Israel on the mountaintop, called Torah. Jesus preached the Beatitudes, the law of the kingdom on the mountain. Parallels all the way up to the Transfiguration, which confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah, where Moses is present to even cast his vote. Yeah, he's the guy. To say Jesus is like Moses is to proclaim that he is a liberator, and he has come to release you from your bondage. But his name is Yeshua, not Moses. Moses began the Exodus, Joshua finished it. Poor old Moses died an old man, short of going into the promised land. It was Joshua who finally led his people into the life that was long awaited, most expected, 
incessantly prayed for the fulfillment of their lives. So when the angel says his name shall be called Yeshua, or Jesus, in Joshua, the name reveals what he will do. The name says, God saves. The tradition of the name means that he will save you from whatever holds you in bondage and will lead you to the fulfillment of your life. That's pretty good news, right? Jesus is the one who comes to liberate. In their book, Jesus Manifesto, Leonard Sweet and Frank Viola talk about the central importance Jesus plays in every believer's life. The center and circumference of the Christian life is none other than the person of Jesus. All other things, including those related to him, are eclipsed by the sight of his fearless work. God put an image in our galaxy to demonstrate what Christ is to us. We call it the Son. Without it, no life can exist on planet Earth. We are dependent on the Son for everything. And just as the Son is the center of our solar system, Jesus is the centerpiece of God's universe, of our lives. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer pointed out in his book, Christ the Center, Jesus is the center of human existence, of history, and the center between God and nature. History is his story. Of this connection, British author H.G. Wells remarks, I'm an historian. I'm not a believer. But I must confess, as a historian, that this perilous creature from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominating figure in all of history. Yet Christ isn't just found at the center, he's also found in the corners and the edges, just as the light of the sun hits all of planet Earth. Indeed, Jesus is not just the Lord of the middle and the margins, He's the Lord of the whole show. The bright and morning storm, bright and morning star, which gives light to all the world. After 2,000 years, Jesus' light shines ever brighter, and we can track his brilliant gleam into the shadowy realms of whatever blue there is. And right now, in our world, there's plenty of blue. Knowing Christ intimately and in every season of our experience is the chief pursuit. <clears throat> or as Paul told us from, every moment might be the small gate through which the Messiah will enter. All of time is holy. All of time represents a moment where we can encounter Jesus. And that's profound. Which brings us to a discussion and new look at the church's liturgical calendar. In his book, How Do We Have a Time, James K. A. Smith talks about the importance of the liturgical calendar for spiritual formation. Uh, some of us have been reading this book over the last few months at our discipleship group. He relates, the liturgical calendar rehearses the way time curves and bends around the incarnate Christ like a temporal center of gravity. Year after year, during Advent, the church we live the messianic hope of Israel awaiting the promise, but it has been doing so for 2,000 years since the Messiah was first born in Bethlehem. Every year, the church walks with Jesus toward Gethsemane, bears witness to his anguish and suffering, steps again into the childhood shadow of the cross, lives through the harrowing silence of Holy Saturday, and arrives at Easter morning to witness the explosion of light that is the resurrection of the Son of God. For millennia, the church has followed the Magi over and over again, seeking the threatening, the threatened king. Two thousand times in council, the church has been perplexed by the ascension and then staked its life on Pentecost. Now, for those unfamiliar with liturgical time, this might seem to be a recipe for boredom. Again? Didn't we do this last year? It is perhaps misunderstood as if the point was simply to remind us of what happened, as if the liturgical calendar were merely a memorial device. 
but it is something more enchanting than that. It is an invitation into the event itself, an experience of existential contemporary contemporaneity. In the liturgical calendar, we are indexed to the soul of time of the sun, who is the light of the city of God. That's a mouthful, but here's what I want to get at. We're being formed day by day into little Christ. We're being made to more and more resemble Jesus, and the way that happens is liturgical time, which is very different than secular time. And this was really brought home to me this last week in a news story I saw. Maybe you saw it as well. When they were talking about uh, getting ready for Christmas, there was a segment where it showed the Biden putting up their Christmas tree. And it was Christmas Eve. And the newscasters were kind of aghast at that. They were like, oh, that's what? At least they're getting it done. I mean, they're just going to have to take it down tomorrow, but at least they got the tree up. And the whole thing was, they were not thinking about liturgical time at all. Because what is Christmas Eve? The start of the Christmas season, which is the very opposite of what our culture does. Our culture starts celebrating Christmas back at Thanksgiving. And it's Christmas all the way up to the 25th of December, and we buy all kinds of stuff to celebrate, and we drink all kinds of stuff, and we eat all kinds of stuff, and then we forget that the festival is just beginning. And then it's about a baby who's being threatened by a king and becomes an immigrant to a foreign country to escape being harmed. Okay? That's what the liturgical calendar brings us in. A whole different thing in terms of time and what time means and what time is doing. So how are you and I going to make ourselves available to the new thing that God is doing in 2022? Perhaps by taking a look at the disciplines and practices we regularly engage in to see if they are helping us become more like our teacher and mentor Jesus. Are the routines and habits that make up your daily life helping you to ensure that Jesus is your central focus and not an afterlife? Or are they leading you away from the life that Jesus would have you live? time to begin thinking about these things is now. And all God's people said, let's stand for the hymn of the day.
thanksgiving for churches coming into the world, for Christ coming into the world. We pray for the church, the life of the earth, and the whole human family. Holy God, you have given the church the holy name of Jesus, and in him we are your beloved children. Unite us in mission through the power of his spirit. Make us worthy of the name we bear, the name in which we pray. God of grace, hear our prayer. Reviewing God, restore your glory to the earth. Awaken humanity to our kinship with all living things that depend on your provision. Teach us to care for the earth and safeguard its treasures for those who come after us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Peacemaking God, reconcile the nations, lead those in conflict into negotiations, especially in areas of religious or ethnic strife. End acts of aggression and violence carried out in your name, God of grace. You are aware. Delivering God, rescue our siblings in any danger, especially in communities where disaster and disease threaten. Move those in authority to respond with speed and compassion. We pray for the safety of first responders, healthcare workers, and all who protect us. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Healing God, raise up any who are bowed down with illness or sorrow. Deepen our care and concern for one another. We lift to you all who are undergoing transition in relationships occupation, living situation, or health condition. God of grace, Hear our prayer. saving God, redeem us and grant us eternal peace. We give thanks for the faithful departed who now rest in your undying love, made known to us in Jesus our Emmanuel. God of grace, Hear our prayer. pondering the mystery of eternal love made flesh in Christ Jesus, we commend all for whom we pray to the mercy of God. Amen. Right? 
mighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, in the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, you may be drawn to love the God who you cannot see. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise you not your name and glory in their unending hymn. <laughs>
If you are comfortable coming forward, uh, there's also some cups and pieces of bread in the back on the table that you can take for your seating. Come, for all is now ready.
You have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very son, that we may feast on your great love. Still began by these signs of your grace. May we hunger for your way of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. You are Lord forevermore. Now I want to invite you to join me into a special prayer that was put together by the Church of Kenya as a post-communion prayer that kind of goes along with our theme of time. Let us join together. O God of our ancestors, O God of our people, before whose faith the human generation has passed away, we thank you that the new that has placed in our earth, and that the broken fragments of our history are gathered up into the beginning path of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in this holy sacrament of bread and blood. Help us to walk daily in the communion of the saints, and bring our faith into the forgiveness of sin and the resurrection of God. Now send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to live the work of your praise and glory. Amen. Congregation may be seated, and at this time I'd like to invite those whose birthdays or anniversaries.
who reveals their Son to all people by the shining light of the star. We pray that we bless this congregation and the wider world in which it finds itself with your gracious presence. May your love be our inspiration, your wisdom our God, your truth our light, and your peace our benediction. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen.